A little over two years ago, I made some reviews on my channel talking about the Klonoa games, and in the last of my reviews, I discussed how there was some speculation of remasters or remakes of the Klonoa games coming out at some point, and that by uploading the last of those videos on my birthday, maybe that would spread a little magic on that, and maybe we could actually get those. Lo and behold, not only did we get a remaster of not only Klonoa 1, but also Klonoa 2, but it was also released on my birthday. I really ought to be playing the lottery with those kind of odds. Planola comes out of my birthday! Planola Fantasy Reverie series has been available for a couple of weeks now, and I guess as a small spoiler, I am really, really happy with the package here. It's been a long enough gap since my last upload, I am still working hard on the next main review, but I thought it would at least be a good idea for me to sit down and talk about what I like about this remaster and why I think it's something that you should pick up for yourself. Obviously, I was super excited about this from the moment that it was announced. No, no, oh my god, oh! That said, I wish the road leading to this release had been just a little bit smoother. I remember seeing how in Europe and in Japan, we were starting to see how the physical editions of the game were coming out. They were making announcements about all of that on Twitter, and I was waiting patiently for a few days, just waiting to see that North America was also getting some physical editions, and yeah, no, we, uh, we didn't. Bandai Namco is bad at marketing their games in America. Like, I've still barely heard anything about Digimon Survive, and that game is coming out really soon as of the recording of this video, and it's asinine to me. Just like, the level of ineptitude when it comes to just making sure that word about their games is getting out there. Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series was getting a little bit of buzz on Twitter, other forms of social media, but not in the States. Europe and Japan? Sure. Still not to the degree that you would think, but in the States, it was really quiet, to the point where review codes didn't go out until like the day of, or I think the day before the game was actually released. There was also a demo made available on the Switch weeks prior in Japan, but not in America. It just wasn't made available until the day before the game actually went live, and I think it was only because the Steam versions went up first on July 7th, and it just did really well and I feel like Bandai just suddenly realized, oh, there's a market for this, no thanks to them. It's really just been a lot of people in the Klonoic fan community, a lot of people, other content creators and stuff like that, just getting the word out about that. I don't know how this game would have done if it weren't for everyone else doing the legwork for them. Now, how is this game gonna do in the general market? I'm not sure. I still don't really know what the sales figures are on this game or what the likelihood of seeing maybe another game in the Klonoa series is after this. We did see some reports that I think it was the director of the remakes was saying that if the Reverie series did really well, that might mean we actually get to see something more from this franchise later down the road. And I'm getting really, really tired of franchises being held hostage by stuff like that. It's still nowhere near as bad as like, say, Chibi Robo, where Ziplash was like, the thing that dictated whether or not there was going to be more in that series when that game didn't even represent what that series was about. But this still wasn't a great look, and I was also kind of miffed when I saw that there was a DLC made available alongside the game that was $20 for like four or five hats Klonoa can wear in the game. $20! $20! So yeah, no North American physical release for this game. I mean, the Pac-Man World 1 remake is getting one, so I don't know why this couldn't have. The weird priced DLC, the complete lack of marketing, it's just, I'm so glad that I'm happy with the game as is because everything else surrounding it was completely frustrating. I, I don't understand why these companies so often handle these releases so poorly and then they'll just blame the intellectual property for them not knowing how to handle their side of the job. But at least there is something good to be found here and that would be the Reverie series itself. This is a really good way to play both of these games. I do still have some unfortunate reservations about the way Door to Phantom Isle has been handled, but I would still in no way say that this is a bad way to play that game, and it's still something I can very, very easily recommend to people. I do have one spoiler-esque thing to mention on that note, but that's gonna be later on. I'll warn you when it comes up, that way you can skip that part of the review. But for the most part, let's just go ahead and just jump in here. 
Planula Door to Phantom Isle has probably seen the largest amount of availability out of any other game in this series, between its re-release on the PSN, its remake on the Wii. Uh, this is the game that I think was probably easier for people to get into, and so, you know, this getting the remaster treatment, while really nice, wasn't as big of a deal as seeing Lunatae's Veil get the same. That said, I was still really pleased with what I played here. Overall, I would say that this is a big improvement off the Wii version. It's very clearly built off of that foundation. A lot of the elements are all the same. They're just kind of like cleaned up a little bit. Klonoa himself is looking a lot more accurate to the way that he did in the original PS1 version, which I greatly prefer. I did see that some people were disappointed that there wasn't at least like an available costume or something that made it look a little more similar to the way he did in the Wii version. And I really don't want to discount people that wanted that in there, but it's definitely not something that I found very important as I didn't really care for that redesign anyway. That said, yeah, sure, the option to have it there would probably not have hurt. I don't know if there would have been a geometrical thing, what with him probably being a different size than the base Klonoa that's in this remake, but that's all just kind of getting into semantics I'm not really sure of. The one thing I can say I'm glad is not here is the English voice acting from the Wii version, because I hated that. It's all just rips of the Phantom Isle language from the PS1 original. It is kind of crunchy. The audio quality is very clearly just this was from the PS1 game, but I think it lends to a certain level of charm to the game. It almost adds to the sort of dreamlike quality. There's something very cute about uh, about that that little quality there. And Klonoa himself is a lot more expressive than he was in the Wii version too. They give him a lot more facial expression. He moves his head around a lot more. Got nothing in my brain. He just feels more alive, and that's definitely something that I was missing from the Wii make. I think the way the environments really pop here is super nice. It looks great on the Switch OLED, like absolutely gorgeous, and I love, love playing this on my PS5. I will say the PlayStation 5 version is a little smoother. There were some dips in the Switch port where I think I noticed some like frame dragging or something like that. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it. It felt like something just wasn't running at 100% what it was supposed to in the Switch version, but I can also say it was never distracting enough to actually take me out of the experience. I never thought it got that bad on any platform that I played it on. In terms of the gameplay, nothing has really changed. It's the exact same game that you've played before. This is Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle. The benefit is that not everyone has played that title, so this is a good way for people to jump into this for the first time. If they're just trying to get into the Klonoa series, if they've heard everybody raving about it on Twitter and YouTube for the past couple of years, now they can finally see what it's all about. The only concessions that I really have about this title are in some levels of its presentation, and a lot of that is down to the voice work and the cutscenes. Now, like I mentioned before, the voice work is all just rips from the PS1 version during cutscenes. When the characters are talking in exposition dialogue and everything like that, that's the PS1 dialogue. But in the actual levels themselves, Klonoa is hopping around and when he's shouting or making his little noises, it's all newly recorded dialogue, and you can tell just by how how different the audio quality is. It's very, uh, it's a very stark difference. There are two moments in the game where I find this particularly distracting, and they are kind of story-centric. So this part right here is very spoiler-heavy. Skip to this time code right here if you want to skip this part. That's the time right there. They skip to that. All right, is everybody gone? Good. So during the cutscenes, Klonoa always speaks in his PS1 dialogue, except for one key moment, Grandpa's death. This is a really, really hard-hitting scene. It is rough your first time through. It's still kind of hard to experience on subsequent playthroughs because you get completely sidelined by this. This is not something I think anybody would expect out of such an adorable little game, but it is a really dark moment, and I think that the pain Klonoa is feeling is really important here. So it's really, really distracting to me that all of the dialogue is ripped straight from the PS1 version, and again, you can hear it in the audio quality until his final screech at the end of the scene. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> 
There are a couple of issues with this, and the first is that, well, I think the line delivery from the PS1 version is better. I think it just hits so much harder. I think it just sounds a little bit more painful, and I think it really is needed to help sell this moment. But the other thing is, it's just really distracting. I don't think you have to have any prior context going into this to understand that this sounds really different in this final line as compared to all of the lines that just preceded it. It's so weird, it comes out of nowhere, and I do not understand why this line was changed. It's so inconsistent. You used all of the PS1 dialogue throughout the entire game for every cutscene except for one line where it might have needed the PS1 version the most. And then, of course, the other thing I have to talk about is the ending. Yes, the original FMVs from the PlayStation version of this game are still better. This is still, again, very clearly based off the Wii version. You can tell it just from the way this engine is running, and I am willing to, to concede that this is probably on some level a budgetary constraint. Like, I'm sure the team just didn't have the resources given to them to do any more than what's available here. How are we set 25 years later and still unable to reach the level of quality that those original FMVs on the Sony PlayStation 1 had. The color grading, the camera work, even the way some character shots begin and end, like the way Lafis is brought into the scene is so much better in the PS1 version, and the fact that the lip syncing actually matches what's coming out of her mouth, whereas in the remake, it is really stilted. It, her model still looks better than it did in the Wii version, I'll give them that, but it's still really distracting that this scene just isn't as well presented as it was in the original over two decades ago. The transition to the storybook is still weird. Hupo still doesn't have his smile. If you want to know why I think that's a problem, here I have a video all about it right here. I'll leave it in the freaking description or something. But even down to the point where they couldn't even get the sky to go darker, or grayer or anything. I don't know, even the sound design just sounds a little bit off to me. But the way that this world looked so lifeless in the PS1 version before Klonoa was stripped out of it, also just fit thematically. The Song of Rebirth was setting everything back to the way that it was supposed to be. So, you know, making everything look just fine before and after Klonoa disappears feels like there's no greater context to what he was doing here, or why him leaving was important, or why the Song of Rebirth was even needed. That's my thing here, is that yeah, the FMVs from the original do look better, but they also just made more sense. But is it a deal breaker for me? No, not necessarily. I do think it creates an unfortunate scenario where I do not think that there is a definitive version of Door to Phantom Isle anymore. Yeah, the cutscenes from the original are still unmatched, but that is not to discount the work that went into the rest of this remaster. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I've been seeing a lot of people using these remasters to experience this game for the first time, and that ending is still apparently hitting them just as hard as it did for a lot of us when we were playing the PlayStation original. So, you really can't say that this ending still isn't effective. I know I'll still be going back to the original version of this game a lot, but I can at least say that I would still easily recommend this version of the game to people who are trying to experience this game for the first time. I have had my grievances, I've aired them, but they don't ruin the experience. I don't want to make it sound like this game is a couple of moments, and if you don't get those right, the rest is garbage. This is a good game. It's a really good puzzle platformer, and I think it should be played by as many people as could possibly be interested in and this level of availability is nothing but a good thing. So no, I'm not going to be the purest guy that says the original is still the only way to go. This is a great way to experience this game. Still highly recommend, but it does bring in the other half of this package. Obviously, I was excited to see that Door to Phantom Isle was getting out there again. I love that game to death, but it's also seen a larger amount of availability compared to other games that came out later on in the series. As of at least this moment, you can still download it on your PlayStation 3 or maybe your PS Vita. The Wii version is at least 
least easier to track down than the PS1 original, and the original PS1 game is still really, really easy to emulate. People have been talking about this one. I feel like this one probably makes the rounds a lot easier than any other game in the franchise. In recent years, I've been seeing more and more people sit down with this game, and in some cases, even having their adorable little hearts shattered by it. But it's also hard for me to overstate just how much it means to me that this same treatment was also given to Lunatea's Veil. This game came out on the PlayStation 2 21 years ago, and that was it. No re-releases, no remasters, no digital storefronts. This game was just sort of left to the tides of time. I do remember reading at one point, although I don't know if I was ever able to verify this, that if the Wii version had done well enough, that the developers were going to go ahead and go forward on a similar remake of Lunatae's Veil on that same system, but that just didn't happen. Whatever the case, it's here now. It's back. You can buy this on any modern system, and that is so fantastic. I think as a sequel, Lunatea's Veil is outstanding. I think it really capitalizes on Klonoa's movements, on his abilities, on the way his level structure just works for puzzle platforming. I think that this is a really intelligently built game, and the fact that this game is so readily available now means everything. Again, I don't want to go into the spoilers here, I've already done videos about this, but while I did have a couple of gripes with Dora to Phantom Isle in this collection, I have no such qualms with Lunatae's Veil. In fact, there may be one or two elements that were just kind of snuck in there, maybe for the last cutscene, that sort of thing, that I don't want to give away, that I just thought were cute. I really can't think of anything from this version of Lunatae's Veil that I don't like as much, if not better, than the original. And that is exactly what I was hoping to be able to say about this. The controls are fantastic, the music is as great as it ever was, the present presentation is so beautiful. This is a gorgeous game. Background elements will end up merging into the foreground, helping make your path just out of a ton of different things that help sell that this is a breathing, living world. Now, playing these games back to back, it becomes a lot more apparent that these levels are a lot longer than they were in the first game, and I honestly don't mind that. Again, I do think that these are really engaging. I think that the way that these levels are designed are in some ways superior to the original, but Nick, or a game apologist, did also point out to me that there are a lot of portions in the second half of this game where you'll be returning to a lot of levels, and they're just kind of like the darker, harder versions of that same vision, but the fact that it's not something that ever really occurred to me before kind of means that I think that whatever they were going for here, they pulled it off. Even on return visits, the environments are a lot more treacherous, the puzzles are a lot tougher, the enemies hit a little harder, like, I don't mind going back through a lot of these areas because I really do think that I get a different experience on the return trip than I did from the first one. I do remember one thing that I was kind of nervous about just from the trailer was the amount of excessive bloom that I was seeing in Lunatae's Veil, but one, the PC version actually just lets you turn bloom off as an effect altogether, and while the console versions don't have that feature, I did notice that they really, really toned that down for the final release. In fact, I was never distracted by the bloom at all. I think that this version of the game is absolutely gorgeous. I do somewhat miss the thick black outline that a lot of the characters had in the original, kind of going for that cell shaded approach, but it's again not one of those things that's like a make it or break it thing for me. It's not something that I think this game needed, and I think it gets by just fine without it. At this point, I'm just going to be talking around in circles. I am really, really happy with the package here. I don't want to make it sound like my thoughts on the remaster for the first game are too negative. There are one or two things I don't like. Yes, but in total, I was absolutely thrilled to get to revisit both of these games through these remasters. I played through both games several times over the past couple of weeks. When I finally got my imported physical edition of the game in for the PS5, I tried playing it, and then I just couldn't help myself. I just had to go and play through the games again. It gave me an excuse to record more footage. Also, I forgot to throw this in there, but the, uh, the pixel filter is stupid. I don't get what they were going for with this. Does this emulate any of the previous games visually? Uh, the PS1 version didn't look like this. I don't 
know what they were going for here, man. I don't know what the future of Klonoa is. I want to say that we could get another game because I am seeing such a warm reception to this collection. I think Klonoa has always lended itself well to a series format. I think that the ability to hop between dreams, to meet all of these amazing new characters and all of these strange worlds, helping people out with their unique problems that also kind of help inform Klonoa as a character is such a strong concept and it's been such a wasted potential because we haven't gotten more from this franchise, but maybe, just maybe, this is leaving the door open for that. Whatever the future holds for the Dream Traveler, I'm hoping I'll get to see you there experiencing it with me. I do apologize, these side quest videos are not scripted and it's been a little while since I've actually gotten to sit down and record at all for anything, but I am finally done with the move, I am slowly getting a hold of my life together here again, I really want to work on videos again, it's been driving me crazy not being able to, and more stuff is on the way, trust me, and I am really, really excited about what I get to share with you next. Of course, having the support of all of my viewers and of course my Patreon means the world to me. Even in my hiatus, more people have been jumping on the Patreon. Thank you guys so much. I mean that for absolutely everybody on this list. Thank you guys. It means the absolute world. Of course, I do have to give a very special shout out to this month's top tier patrons. They are Brendan Hess, Christine Larkin, Earl Valco, Jeremiah Harrison, Lederick, Mackenzel, Mr. SP, Wanton Photo, NBTV, Nickel Plated, Patricia Marcou, Cinderin7, and Cirrus the Skeptic. I would not be able to get to do all of this stuff without you guys. Thank you so, so much for your support. You guys make this possible and you make it worth it. With all of that said, it's back to the grind. I'm really, really happy to be back. I am really, really excited for what's in store and I hope you are too. See you next mission.